So, um, how many of us are on the panel? I forget. Five? There are five on the panel. Mm -hmm. I, is Glenda here and I'm not seeing her? Mm. I would like to, oh, there you are, Glenda. Welcome. Thank you. Great to have you. Um, so I, I, I see I, Bio I, and Django and Teddy. Hey, <laughs> hi guys. Hey. Uh, if anybody here, in case doesn't know, this or this is Jeff's uh, brother-in-law, Bio, and that's Django up front, and that's Teddy, uh, looking not quite as mischievous behind Django. <laughs> <laughs> And I am proud to say my son Casimir is also in the audience today. Oh, great. He's 19 and a first year student. Um, so very happy about that. Augustina. Hey, hey, that wasn't your name. I didn't notice at first. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi, Augustina. How are you? Good. How are you? All right. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, let's just have a party. <laughs> That sounds fabulous to me. I, I, I did write a little something. My name is Joe Krause. I'm the president of Mellis for another for under 24 hours. Um, uh -huh. And I'm happy to report my successor, uh, Tracy Floriani, is here as well. Um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know uh, Jeffrey, um, I, I, I'm, and I'm very sorry about that, but uh, I feel I have gotten to meet him through the work he wrote. And it's, it's very, very moving. I enjoyed it as scholarship, but um, one of the things I was I wrote and was I think it's maybe better just to say was the extent to which I experienced it as essays, in the sense that Montaigne talked about that that it's it's the play of a really sharp mind making sense of the world around it, um, and so I found that just utterly moving as scholarship and and as a person whose whose sense of self um, comes through in in the work work that's often impersonal the work that we do the critical work um, and to, to experience it that way it just was. A, a really terrific opportunity. I, I love the feeling already of, of a lot of um, a lot of family and friends who are here to celebrate that work. We have a, a panel of, of five. Um, I, uh, I, I, I will need to read this to make sure I don't miss any. Uh, we have uh, Ken Warren um, from the University of Chicago, Glenda Carpio from Harvard, uh, Farah Jasmine Griffin from Columbia, David Blight from Yale, and Magdalena uh, Zaborowski from, uh, from my alma mater, the University of Michigan. Um, such a distinguished panel. Uh, I think that speaks, uh, when, when we put out the call, um, Werner Solers uh, suggested a number of you, everybody said yes immediately. No one said, what are the details? Everyone said, how can we be a part of this? And that's a tribute I know, not in any way to me, but to Jeffrey and to the memory um, that, that he has. So I, I was hoping we could begin uh, informally, David, you suggested a party. I really love the sound of that. Um, but you mentioned that you wanted to say a few uh, 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 recollections of Jeffrey as a person. Um, and I, uh, uh, Farah, you mentioned that as well. If any of the other panelists would like to do that, I, I, I would love to hear from you. And then we can move on to a series of, uh, of questions. I have a few in mind, but I think it'd be much more interesting if we can generate things organically. If you do have a question and you're in the audience and would care to put it in the chat, I'll, I'll see if we can read that out loud at some point. Um, but otherwise, David, if you don't mind um, uh, convening, I, I, I would be, really be grateful. Well, uh, well, thank you, Joe, and great to see everybody. Uh, this is dangerous if we start doing personal <laughs> reflections on Jeff. Uh, this might not end. Um, good Lord. Um, I wrote a six-page essay on Jeff uh, when he passed two years ago. And there are a lot of personal thoughts in there that I'll, I'll, I'll put aside, I guess. Um, we're gonna get to Jeff's work and his writing here soon that I, I understood to be the principal purpose of this and indeed uh, to do a tribute to this new book uh, of Jeff's essays. Um, I first met Jeff in September of 1987. I was a nobody assistant professor that Werner and Nathan Huggins had the courage to hire at Harvard in the FM department and the history department. And Jeff Ferguson was this guy who used to hang out in the lounge at Dunster Street and just look for a conversation. And uh, at that point, he was selling balloons up at Filene's. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know him. 
Good to hear and this. every time I'd come into the mail room, there he'd be <laughs> hooking me. He was either reading, well, he, he had he had stages of intensive reading then. He was reading all of Freud. He was reading all of William James. He was reading all of Melville. Uh, he would hook me to talk about Ralph Ellison. I found Jeff at first a bit intimidating and a bit problematic because here I was brand new at Harvard. I didn't know what I was doing. And I had to teach, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get my book out. And Jeff just wanted to spend hours talking, which of course, those of us who know him, knew him, know that that is one of the things he was best at. Uh, he would also do the same thing down at the corner where old Bonpan was, which uh, we used to, he used to call his office hours. Um, but from Jeff, I began to learn the craft and the art of conversation. As long as I knew Jeff, which was 31 years, he always was chastising me for not taking more time to just sit down and read more. He said, Debbie, you got to read this. You got to read that. You got to read this. You got to read that. Have you read this? Have you read that? He was always telling me to read French theorist, which I frankly was never very good at. But, and I was always running out on the road to give talks. And then we were together at Amherst, especially. And one of the most endearing things Jeff ever said to me was, David, you are precisely what I do not want to be. <laughs> By which he meant, you're always writing this and running out to give a talk and worrying about whether you got that finished and worrying about whether you've written that piece on time. Jeff just wanted to read. Jeff is, is a throwback to the coffee house intellectual. There's a reason in Amherst we called him the mayor of Rails, which was the coffee house in Amherst, where I believe, as legend has it, Augustina, where you and Jeff met. Um, at least that's the way he told it. Um, I have a thousand other Jeff stories and I should probably just save them for the moment, except that uh, I guess I do want to say that there was a mind at work here that we lost. And since today is about his writing, there was a mind at work here, frankly, like no other I ever knew. Jeff was an intensive reader a very serious thinker. He did not easily suffer fools. He did not particularly like uh, soft piety. He loved the contradictions of the world. Irony was his coin. Satire was a method. And uh, Jeff was always questioning other people's certainties. And God, the world needs that now. <laughs> it's always needed it. And God, we need it again. Maybe we can come back to the essays and perhaps, I mean, I have a few reflections on if Jeff had lived these next two years, uh, what he might be thinking now. Um, so I I'll just stop there because I know Farah goes back even further, I think, with Jeff than I do. So uh, I'll pass it on. Thank you. I mean, it's actually an extension of what you said. I met Jeff in the September 1981 freshman week. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were, he lived over in the dorms by Union, um, not in the yard. Um, he was a guardian angel um, with the red beret. <laughs> um, he was always just as David described him. He was the thinker in our class, the, um, the intellectual, the reader, the observer. He, he observed everyone <laughs> and had um, a kind of analysis of each type, you know? Um, and he, I, I, I think it's important to say he was the most intellectually generous person I knew in terms of with his peers, even though you're right, he didn't suffer fools. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I just recall Jeff teaching me how to study for one of, um, for, for a Nathan Huggins exam, teaching mm -hmm. me the strategy for studying for a Nathan Huggins. I'd be like, I know everything, I know it all, and I could write everything. And he's like, 
okay, that's a good start, but you know, <laughs> you've gotta be a little more strategic than that. Um, and I think when I was running away from my intellectual self because I wanted to be normal, <laughs> um, I wanted to be, you know, go to law school. Um, it was Jeff who kind of kept my feet to the fire always um, about, you know, what he thought, what he saw was my true kind of self as a reader and thinker and certainly never in the same way that he was. And um, when we get to his essays, we'll talk about this as David said, but when I was reading them, I felt exactly like, oh, I'm having one of those conversations that will go on forever, you know, at Aubon Pan or before that in Adam's House Dining Hall or all night long somewhere else. And, um, and everything I think I know, I will be challenged because he won't just under, undermine kind of the information that I know, but he will challenge the way I'm thinking about what I think I know, right? When I don't even know that there's a framework informing the way I'm reading something. Um, Jeff would always be there to challenge that. And um, I always felt smarter on the other side of my conversations with him. And we fought. We did fight. I mean, I, I, I'm fighting with him in this book. <laughs> As yeah, I'm, yeah, I am too a little fighting bit. Fighting with him. <laughs> um, you know, and I just wish he were there to tell me why I was wrong. But yeah, so David, I, I think that I just knew an earlier version, but it's the same, Jeff. Mm -hmm. oh, that seems like a terrific place to move into the text as well, maybe to, to invite Jeff to fight with all of us if we can uh, at the moment. And um, I, a question I'd like to lead with, though, so please take it whatever direction you like. As I read the title essay here, and I think we could argue that it, the ideas weave throughout uh, the rest of the book, he's critiquing a sense of, of, of a rhetoric of race that's defined almost entirely by resistance as against something else. And I hear him calling for something that in my probably inadequate paraphrase is a kind of, uh, as, as opposed to a negative emancipation, as opposed to an emancipation defined through the resistance of something else, I see him beginning to work toward a notion of what I would call a positive emancipation, a, a larger awareness of, of sort of African-American culture uh, and, and race writ large. Please feel free to correct that paraphrase, any of you on the panel. Um, but I'm curious to know uh, from there what, what you think the limits of a crit crit such a critique are. Is it possible to move beyond this resistance rhetoric? And if so, what, what do we lose along the way? I'm going to start us off by just noting something, not necessarily answering your question. But um, one of the things that for me characterizes Jeff's thinking is um, you know, I, I, you know, satire is a method, right? As, as, Dave, as David said, uh, and it's a way of satirizing um, the notions of purity, right? So, like in the essay on the blues, he says that the purest thing about um, this this promiscuous musical form is this defiance of purity, and so the idea of resistance, I think, like he took us back to say, okay, so in a narrative of resistance, there's gotta be like forces that are well-defined that are, are clashing up against each other. And I think one of the things that he encouraged us to think about was what, so when we say resistance, is there like a, a unified form or a, a set of ideas that are going up against something? Um, so like the blues or uh, in thinking of Du Bois, right? Like, what are the contradictions in Du Bois' thoughts? What are the contradictions in how we think of the folk and what the folk have produced, right? So before we even get to resistance, I think what's, what was really, what is, remains, will always be uh, amazing about his thinking is that he gets us to examine the categories that we're using to even begin to talk about resistance, right? Um, so um, that's what made so many of the conversations with him uh, so, so spirited and long, right? Because he would get you to think about like, okay, if this is the, the thought that you're, you're, you're proposing, what's behind that thought? I, as Farah said, there's, you know, you're, what are the structures that are upholding your point of view, right? Um, so I think maybe, that, maybe that's a place where we can start 
before we even get to your question. Terrific, yeah. Magdalena? Yes, um, I would like to, to jump in here with a thought. And again, thank you so much everyone for introducing the person. I have not been so lucky as to have met um, Jeffrey Ferguson in person, but I've seen a couple of his videos and I've tried to kind of get to know him through this book and through his writing. And what I find really um, sad about his passing is that this book seems unfinished. There is no proposed new narrative. There is no way in which the invisible man emerges from underground having said yes to life and having embraced this new individual spiritual, very sort of holistic type of freedom that we see in the escape chapter. And that's where the conversation hasn't been finished. So thank you, David, and thank you, Farah, for painting a portrait of the person, of the thinker, of the conversationalist, uh, because I can feel the passion in the language. I can feel the mind on fire and it's incredibly inspiring and it's incredibly thrilling to me as a scholar and as a lover of African-American literature. And I have been working quite a bit on James Baldwin and on his ideas of what to do, uh, getting away from the narrative of resistance, getting away from the narrative of suffering, getting towards pleasure where there is expression and playfulness, where irony and satire can be harnessed for beautiful, playful bridge building um, across the divisiveness uh, that Werner spoke about in his keynote today, for example. So I, um, I actually have a lot of questions for everyone because I'm so excited to be in the same well Zoom room with you. Uh, having known Jeff, do you think he had a recipe? Do you think he had a kind of an ending or a sequel planned for this book where there is an alternative narrative, where is something beautifully wrought that he had in mind. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know for sure, and I suspect Werner knows better. Um, but one of, the, one of Jeff's favorite things was to sit up late at night to plan the books we would never write. Uh, <laughs> and there were a lot of them, I must tell you. Uh, uh, so <laughs> there were going to be all kinds of spinoffs from this resistance project. There was also going to be a full biography of Schuyler, which I thought would, would have, you know, a real full biography of the life, which probably no one else has the courage to do. Uh, but no, I don't know if he had a grand plan. Werner um, yeah. might, though. I don't know. <laughs> well, I can, I mean, wait, I'll, I'll let Werner answer before I jump well, in. No, Ken, you go ahead. No, I was going to say that, um, um, you know, the, the, in, in some respects, um, and this is reading too much because I, my um, um, encounters with Jeff over the years were as a, as a colleague through uh, various, uh, you know, uh, correspondences and a, a few discussions in um, um, uh, conference settings. So I don't have anything like a deep, uh, deep insight, but I, I, I always appreciated um, the, what I would say is sort of the dialectical quality of his thinking at its best, which means that for him, there were rarely any set um, or stable uh, endpoints. And I think the interest in Schuyler um, was important in that way. And uh, was, you know, Schuyler became a very important figure in, the, uh, in, in my book on African-American literature. And part of that process was really engaging with, uh, you know, Jeff's thinking about uh, Schuyler agreeing and disagreeing with him uh, along the way, but with respect to the, to the question of res, you know, resistance, I think the challenge of course, is that you can't imagine, and I think Jeff is really on this point, right? You can't imagine the history of, of, of African-American literature writing without the fact of resistance. And um, it's, it's impossible be, you know, because it is the history of blacks in this country you know, for my argument, particularly with respect to Jim Crow, but, you know, slavery, Jim Crow, and the like, that provides the necessary basis for thinking about resistance to those systems of, of, of oppression and the thought that under, uh, you know, lay those, which is the idea that Blacks necessarily constitute a, uh, a race. And that problem, I mean, I, I think part of the reason that you have to have the dialectical force of this, right, is that when you try to turn the you know from the you know from the negative to the positive, 
which is to say resistance against, and the affirmative version is so easily transformed into a, just a version of the negative, which is to say, in order to resist race, you have race, right? You, uh, but you just produce a better, uh, a better definition or a, a better account. And I think Jeff was very much alive to that uh, tension. And, um, and, and you could say, and, and that stands in the way of the you know, ease within which you could turn from the negative to the, uh, to, to, to the positive. So uh, you know, I think with respect to Magdalena's question, the idea of the out um, is, I, I don't think readily um, available. I mean, what he ends up uh, in one of the essays saying is, well, you know, what we have is a is the, you know, basis for the ongoing study of what African American literature, and you know, and you know, my tendentious point would be, has been or was, and that that is a continuous process, right? But whether or not you need a kind of an ongoing account of what it is and what it ought to be, I, you know, uh, you know, if if I do my version <laughs> of Jeff, which is only you know my version, of course, would be the you know the the argument would be you can't really produce, I think the you know the alternative negative uh, narrative. Um, because what you really are dealing with is a tradition, if you want to call it, or a set of literary practices that emerge um, in um, necessary relation to the heteronomy, the other determined nature of what race and racism in this country, um, um, you know, has been. So I, I don't, yeah, as I said, that's my uh, take on this now. Well, I, I think to get to Magdalena's question, I would think the, the talk that he gave on Du Bois, which was probably the last of the texts uh, that we have in this collection, uh, gives you a little bit of a sense of where the thing was going, which is comparing Du Bois with Gandhi, and by extension, comparing all progressive thinking in the United States with Gandhi's view, what distinguishes <clears throat> Gandhi, in Jeff's view there, is that Gandhi actually liked poor people as they were. And he has a really funny paragraph which says, you don't have to become a vegetarian and not eat cow meat or you know, do all the kind of voodoo that goes with it. But <clears throat> there's something so basically ready to accept people as they are, you know, with flaws, with cares that are about family responsibility rather than big issues. Uh, in order to see a way out of being only negatively defined and therefore forced to engage in particular forms of protest all the time. That's where I sensed a little bit of the, the, the kind of uh, utopian thing. He was also there when Jeff Stewart gave a, a talk when he was working on, on Locke and he, he started out saying, Locke and Du Bois met in a diner in Washington DC to talk about the vibrancy of black folk culture. What was the first thing they did? They boiled all the silverware. Uh, so you know this was the distance of the of the academic contingent dealing with folk. And Gandhi didn't have that distance. You know, Gandhi could accept folk as they as they were. He didn't need to imagine folk in terms of something that needed to be transformed. I think that's sort of where he was going at the at the end of not being only negatively defined through resistance or being only positively defined as blues people or you know just sort of by one tag to have a whole collective uh, definition going but instead being people who have all kinds of traits and uh, you know whom the the reformers shouldn't so easily peg in a particular way that that is my my version of where the where the essay with Du Bois was going at the uh, at the end it's very subtle, the, the, the comparison with Gandhi. I know Yude must be here as well, who was the important influence on Jeff. Uh, they were teaching a course together on Gandhi and Du Bois. And so that's where this, um, the, 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 the whole comparative thinking emerged. He really sensed a, a, diff, a whole different way of imagining this uh, rather than being always tied in a in a kind of, as Ken was just describing it, you know, sort of a, a perennial history of saying resistance, resistance, resistance. I think that we see throughout too, I think Werner, you're right. Um, and, and Magdalena, I, 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 you know, where would he have, I don't think he would have come 
up with an out because he was too interested in the kind of ongoing debate and question and, and, um, and probably would have resisted um, <laughs> any kind of closure. <laughs> um, but, but I also think that, you know, we see this, this was true and we see it in the essays that he remained a student of Professor Huggins. Um, and, you know, I think for both of us, those moments when, and, and I, can, I can remember being in a class when Nathan Huggins is saying this, um, you know, like most of the people didn't follow Harriet, you know, um, and, and, or they didn't, um, they, if someone came and said, we're gonna have a rebellion, they were like, no, I'm not gonna join you. Um, but I am going to try to keep my family together, or I'm going to do this other thing. Um, and so I think that instead of saying um, resist, or um, or you know take part in a kind of more pleasurable um, set of experiences, it's what's the quotidian look like. And how do people get to keep a sense of themselves, their families, their lives intact under the most brutal systems? And to me, that that in and of itself is almost, you know, a kind of resistance to um, the inhumanity of what they're up against, but not uh, not in the ways that I think scholars were celebrating resistance that Jeff was fighting against. But I also think that some interesting there's there have been some interesting turns in Black studies. Um, and I, I wish he were here to have conversations with him about that because there is a body of work that has emerged that has challenged the dominance of resistance as a paradigm. And here I'm thinking of Kevin Kwashi and people like that. And so I would have been very curious to, to hear what Jeff thought about that turn also. If I could just underscore a little bit of what Ferris said. I mean, we're concerned here about where Jeff might have been going with this, which is a fascinating question. But it might be worth asking just for one minute, where did this come from for Jeff? And I think Farah nailed it. It came from, well, again, as far as I understand it, it came from Nathan Huggins. Uh, and on page four and five of this book, there's this passage where he's kind of, he's riffing off Huggins, he's playing, paying tribute to Huggins, he's using Huggins. Uh, and by the way, Jeff and I always used to consider ourselves charter members of the Hugginoids. That was Jeff's term. But anyway, here's uh, page four. He says, Huggins put the 1960s and 70s romance of resistance in his crosshairs, insisting that the lasting meaning of slavery required recognizing that the inconvenient ironies of everyday human interaction exist in a tragic context of oppression. He got a sense of tragedy from Nathan about history in general. And you go on down the page, uh, however rooted in tragedy and irony, his ideas, Huggins' ideas about African-American dignity depend on notions of universal humanity that have long since fallen into disrepute. See, Jeff was pushing back there on the, the, you know, the cultural trend that nothing could be universal anymore. And maybe nothing could even be true, I guess, back in the eighties for a while. Uh, and then it goes on and on, and he even uses that phrasing that historians in particular were really worried about in the 80s, where he says, we think in parts now and not in wholes. And, and embedded in all of that was his tribute to Ho Huggins in that famous introduction to the book Black Odyssey, it's, at least it's still famous to me, uh, was asking for a, a different story. Not a story of just victimization, not just a story of resistance, but is there another story, Huggins was saying? And maybe it had to be in a kind of genuine, tragic mode that Americans are never very comfortable with. <laughs> but I think this is where this began with Nate, or with, uh, with Jeff in those, I guess, fair in those courses he took with Nathan and then in the, his careful reading of Nathan. And, um, and of course, just, and frankly, sitting in that lounge, because they were, they were birds of a feather, man. Those two could talk for hours. And, um, <laughs> and um, it was an education for me just to sit there, I'll tell you. Anyway, I think that's where it begins, at least, this, this uh, if we want to call it hostility to resistance or this critique of resistance. Um, 
Well, that, I mean, that makes a great deal of uh, a, a sense to me, uh, when, particularly when one thinks of, uh, you know, Huggins' uh, Harlem Renaissance book as a book yeah. um, defined, yeah. um, or the book that is very much in conversation, you know, even as it's looking back on the Harlem Renaissance mm -hmm. with the rise of the Black aesthetic and the Black arts movement. And it really um, um, uh, putting forward a brief against the um, extent to which that movement insisted on a distinguishing um, separate version of thinking about African-American literature and African-American uh, um, uh, cultural production. And I, what I saw as Huggins' um, worry or, uh, you know, that, that all that was leading to was a certain kind of parochialism of black thought rather than the, uh, the notion of that thought as, uh, as, as richly engaged. And I was really struck uh, I mean, by so many things in the essays, uh, but one when he uh, in the notes on uh, notes uh, on escape, where yeah. you know among the things he does there is right you know even as he's um, um, noting a distinguishing what he calls a distinguishing feature of black literature you know escape both as action and desire this appears as the most inescapable theme of African American history and, and artistic expression, pushing towards you know a kind of defining move. Then later you know a few pages later. Right. What he does is take that defining, distinguishing move and move that back into a distinguishing feature of American literature altogether. So that suddenly Walden, right, yeah. becomes the uh, document of escape. But it then gives it another twist because the most eloquent formulation of escape turns out then to be Invisible Man. And so now you're back within the entire interplay and the um, uh, uh, you know and the tapestry of American literature um, um, you know as, as a whole. So I do think that there is this sort of you know as I say constant movement back and forth between the recognition of the desire to produce some distinguishing characteristics, but the way that those very characteristics that seem to resonate most uh, distinctly are also characteristics that are, you can see woven into a larger, um, a, a larger whole. So you're always moving back, um, back and forth. So this is great because that's, that's where we can read Du Bois and Fitzgerald together. We can read Ellison and Fitzgerald. We can read The Invisible Man and Great Gatsby. And this is, I, I love how you've put it, Ken, as a kind of dynamic or dialectic of going back and forth or stitching together these strands that seem to be questioning, but then folding back and reinterpreting, recasting the national sort of narrative through these literary expressions. I have a quick question again, and it's a question and a comment on the book and also on, you know, on the critics of Jeff's work. And I, want, I was reading uh, Marisa Param's um, short tribute in uh, the Humanities Commons, and she, she talks about how, um, in some ways, Jeff, uh, if I may be calling him by him, his first name, uh, forgive me, um, I haven't known him, so maybe I shouldn't, um, how, how he would um, take a clinical look at Black Fox literary expressions, how, and I quote uh, the paragraph from Freedom, Equality, and Race, uh, Marisa Parhams talks about it as reading like a primer. But what is it a primer? You know, what is it a primer for? And she specifically talks about this paragraph: out of the necessity of historic struggle, have formed an alternatively heroic, sacrificial, and sometimes melodramatic sense of group belonging, laden with collective memories of struggle on the wrong side of the American color line. These struggles have served not only as ways of acquiring freedom but also as a means of performing it culturally and politically across the great range that encompasses modes of self-fashioning artistic styles and direct forms of political resistance and direct forms of political resistance and protest. And, you know, it's a wonderful, very concise, very, to me, succinct way of putting the issue he is articulating. But I also can see how scholars, interpreters would resist this approach, would back away from this, you know, turning towards more universalist approaches to, to, to humanism, basically. Uh, 
Joe, I didn't mean to take over. I no, no, that's that's quite all right. I stress was allowing to moderating because I'm so curious. <laughs> I, I love what it. Everyone's thinking, so yeah. you said, think on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a joy to sort of uh, sort of see the ball continually pump, pump up, batted up in the air, and and if maybe we can pick up where you were talking about this sort of notion of. Um, race both being a term, and Glenda, you put it, I think, right away, this uh, the troubling the, the, the very terms that we're working with, which makes it such, such a wonderfully slippery business to take part in. So Magdalene, you were talking about the big picture of, of humanities, of the sort of an American studies. How do we juxtapose Gatsby with, um, uh, with, with various African-American texts? How do, we, how do we bring all that together? And I would, I would try just to reformulate your question and bat it back to, to, to the rest of you as a panel. How, how can we take this fundamental insight about the slipperiness of these terms that should be fundamental and then apply them to larger conversations about literature, American literature in, in more broadly? Well, one way we can be, at least begin to think about this is to think about why Jeff was so attracted to Skylar and why Jeff was so interested in humor, you know? Um, and because as a methodology, as a, like, using humor as a kind of methodological perspective um, made him able to see both the trouble of saying the word race, African, the word term African-American or black, white, these very sort of basic, tools with which we talk about um, this problem and the necessity of, of using them. So it's this inherent contradiction, right? In which we want to talk about particularity and universality, um, but if you take them too seriously as like, as like um, reified forms, then you get in trouble. So for, for Jeff, it was a matter of, of kind of, you know, slipping through, in and out um, of like of what the tools that we use and also showing how they're limited, right? And so maybe we can think a little bit more about Jeff's sense of humor, which was expansive, you know, in so much part of his everyday interactions, you know. Um, one of the things about Jeff that I, many things I loved about him is that he was able to be funny with a straight face most of the time, you know, and so, um, I think that also you can see that in his writing, you know, he can, you know, in the one on the boys, he begins to tell you, this is how, or in the one of the essay on the blues, it's like, these are the many ways in which people have used the blues, right? This term has been this, for this uh, these critics, it's a matrix for others. And then he says, but it's also a very body, very commercial form, right? And so, how to how to like sit with the contradictions of what the booze mean, or how to sit with the contradictions of who the voice was, right? Um, I think that may may get us thinking about this problem of the particular and the universal. Uh, Joe, and to pick up on that, uh, let's not forget that one of, one of the chapters in Jeff's George Schuyler book is called "The Right to Laugh." You know, I mean, drawing that right off Schuyler, but that is a fantastic chapter. Uh, it, it's not just about Schuyler, it's about the whole idea of satire and its place in the world. And when Jeff was doing that book, he went to the Mencken papers. He worked in the Mencken papers. He wanted to understand Mencken as a way of understanding Schuyler. Yes. Um, and it, it is true about Jeff. He, uh, if you couldn't laugh about it, you know, if you if you couldn't laugh about tragedy on some level, uh, Jeff didn't want to do it. And, uh, you know, that's not always easy. And it depends on the subject. Um, but he was all about that. Um, and hence the essay on the blues. But uh, but it it really had a lot to do with his attraction to Skylar, too. I mean, and, and, you know, and Jeff more than I mean, maybe Ken, you've done it now, too. But Jeff actually figured out who every one of those characters in Schuyler's novel represented. I mean, he's made it his aim. And it was hilarious, you know, when he was trying to figure those out. It was, <laughs> he made it his mission 
that all those wild names and characters that Skyler used, he was going to figure out who they were, and he did. <laughs> well, on that point, I mean, I certainly just relied on on the extraordinary work that uh, Jeff did in in, in engaging uh, engaging Skyler, and and I think. Um, um, without picking up the point about about humor, the, one of the other ways to uh, think about uh, what that work does in terms of this issue of how to uh, track between the particular and the universal is that, that what I felt Jeff got about that book, at least as I um, read it, is that the force of racism, the point there, right, is to take what is universal and to insist that it doesn't apply to particular groups as such, right? That, that you, you know, so that it's not as if you have the universal and the particular over and against one another. The force of racism is to insist that universal features of who we, of humanity, of decency and the like, don't apply equally to certain people by virtue of uh, by virtue of who they are, and and, and the way that that novel um, by you know um, in this you know the wild experimental. Um, uh, you know, a feature of it sort of dissolves that at a moment, and then you can actually see. Uh, it just sort of produces, you know, to me, the, you know, the, the, I mean, what makes, I think, that novel a kind of classic of, of uh, the problem of African-American literature is that it raises the question, okay, what happens the moment that you dissolve the, yeah. the um, you know, the uh, um, uh, illusion of yeah. difference of a certain sort, what then do you have, right? And then, you know, you sort of, then you bring up the problem of sort of constructing or thinking about what the universal um, is and how desperately people are to get back to um, the, um, you know, means by which you can navigate, uh, you know, the idea that there must be a difference that, you know, various, you know, uh, social racial entrepreneurs can, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, can, can manipulate, right? So the, the, the power there is that you don't have the problem of the universal and the particular as sort of separate kinds of problems. It's that the whole point of race is to strike a blow against the idea of the universal mm -hmm. uh, in favor of the, uh, you know, in favor of a um, uh, uh, disparaging particularity. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree, agree with you, Ken, and I think, you know, there are places, for instance, um, I think it's in the first essay where he goes to Tatarov um, and, and looks at a completely different context, um, but uses it to illuminate, um, you know, so much about specificities in African-American life that is a way of going to the universal. Um, and he does that throughout. And just also Magdalena, when you talked about putting um, Gatsby next to, you know, Du Bois or whatever, um, I think that Jeff is so aware that he's attracted to the writers who are reading across racial lines, right? Who, who recognize that we've we, all, we construct traditions and canons. Um, it doesn't mean that the writers themselves are, are limiting themselves in terms of to whom they're speaking or in, in the case of an Ellison, who he's claiming as a literary ancestor. Um, and that these, you know, that these texts speak to each other in some ways that might be more natural or more part of the same moment than the kinds of forced conversations that we as critics bring up through time. Um, so I think that's going on too. And Farah, I remember fierce conversations with Jeff and Nathan when Nathan put Mark Twain's Puddinghead Wilson in the, in the intro to Black Studies. And Jeff ended up defending it, but it was like, wait, what, what, what? Uh, but Nathan was all over that. Twain had to be there. You know, I don't. I don't think that's happening anymore, is it? I mean, well, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, and I should say because he's being quiet that we were also students of Werner. Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> I think you got a lot of this from Werner. Yeah. I know. I know. In fact, uh, Werner has a whole project going on this kind of thing, right, Werner? <laughs> But I think seriously on the on the question of um, of the things that he draws on. I mean, David, you outlined this constant engagement with Huggins, and mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. You mentioned the the what you you know called the the preface, which was actually the essay that was only attached after Nathan's death, right, right to the book, and it was second exactly, edition, yeah, was unfinished. 
Yeah. Um, you know, just like Jeff's uh, essay on escape. And uh, uh, Huggins proposed that it, the story would be something like Sartre's No Exit that historians would come up with in order to tell the whole American story. So it was a sort of a, a real ironic counterweight to the whole buildup of saying the story is this, the story is that, that. And then at the end, it's a story of, uh, of no exit. I think it's interesting what, uh, what Jeff draws on. Um, Farah's mentioning Todorov, I think is a good example. I also found really interesting in the book his drawing on Shaler's concept on ressentiment. And I haven't seen uh, that very much in the literature on, on African-Americans, but I think it seemed very pertinent to deal with this general issue of ressentiment and put that into the discourse about, uh, about race. So I wonder whether you know, the panelists want to think a little bit more in, uh, about the book. What did they find? You know, he, he comes up with Tocqueville, he comes up with Perry Miller. I mean, he draws on classical American studies stuff, but also on sources that come from completely different mm -hmm. worlds, like the Todorov facing the extreme and Sheila Ressentiment. So how the, the putting together of some kind of theoretical apparatus of resisting resistance or resisting reification of, of any form of one dimensional tags on the, on the universe. Uh, I think how that helps him and, and whether that is interesting at the moment where I think we're in a deep reification mode again. Uh, so, you know, whether there is something from the text that actually speaks today rather than saying, oh my God, he's mentioning Obama, that's old. You know, but uh, what is uh, what's the spirit of the book that might uh, appeal to us today, and what what about the methods could be contagious? Well, Werner, I'll, I mean, I'll take your bait on that. Why not? Uh, and I, I, I'm eager to hear from others here, in, including others who who knew Jeff so well, like Uday and others, maybe. But I can't help. Wishing well, I wish I had Jeff to talk to every day, to be honest. But I wanted Jeff's take on the 1619 project. There's a certain piety about that project, there's a certain teleology about that. I mean, it did many, many good things in awareness and all of that. But good lord, it was almost teleology and uh piety on steroids, and they had everybody on television uh, talking about 400 years of racism as it was just unhistorical. It was just one thing all across time. I wanted a Jeff essay <laughs> on the reception or something of the 1619 project. And as again, we're experiencing a, a, a real resurgence of the reparations issue, as complicated as it is. I mean, I'm chairing a panel next week on reparations here at Yale Ugh, for my sins. But, you know, I, 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 have, I feel myself wanting Jeff to apply this, this kind of analysis to the revival of that again, which, which is almost a, a reflex now. It's almost an impulse that reparations has to be discussed now. A few people, you know, have plans. A few people actually have a tort plan or a symbolic plan or some other plan, but most people just say it has to happen. It's that's that kind of soft thinking that I'd love to hear Jeff take on, you know. And there are many other things that are going on now that I, you know, I, I wish Jeff was around to to critique. Something, some of what's happening in cultural studies, although I don't claim to ent entirely know what's going on in cultural studies. I hear a lot of I hear a lot of language from graduate students, and sometimes I really don't always know what they're what they're saying. But anyway, um, maybe that just means I'm old fashioned. Although I, I did I did it did strike me that the resistance essay seems to have been finished in 08, just before Obama was elected. If I'm if I'm reading that right, and God, that seems like lifetimes ago. <laughs> The first uh, black president might actually be black. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what will people do? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Anyway, I wonder if we can push a little bit on on Werner's observation that, that we're experiencing a moment of sort of reification of race. Um, uh, it's uh, we've all avoided the name of the forty fifth president, but I'm wondering how some of this work lo work looks in the wake of 
of what have been a fairly traumatic four years. So if I may jump in, I'm really um, intrigued by um, deploying Jeff's ideas on ressentiment and also this resistance to reification, especially if we observe this divisiveness. And I mentioned Werner's um, uh, keynote, whose bits and pieces I, I, I caught today. And I think what we are also besieged with is this resurgence of very basic binaries that confuse our students and often prevent us from explaining to them the richness and complexity of the human experience and especially in African-American literary studies where students feel they cannot identify with characters because their epidermal hues do not match. You know, there are scholars who tell them you must not identify. There are also scholars who will tell them the world is divided into black people and not non-black people. Then, you know, if you are uh, queer, you are not fully black because, you know, that's a white thing. So, so there are all these complexities and conflicts and also I think uh, conundra, as, as Baldwin would use it, that I think especially in teaching, I would love to mobilize and to sort of work with um, using Jeff's ideas and using his approach to this dialectic between the particular and the universal, but also how we resist the narrative of resistance in creative, in playful, ironic, sophisticated, critical ways in ways that connect us rather than divide us, in ways that build a new story. And I love that page five quotation from Nathan Huggins of you know, how he calls for a new story. This is the story that I'm sure Jeff would have written had he uh, been with us longer. And so my, my sort of question and my comment is that I find a lot of excitement in this work for this kind of creation of a new story. At the same time, as I'm also thinking, you know, the critics, and I gestured in that in my previous comment, you know, think it's in, in rather simplistic terms, you know, it's kind of the heteronormative African-American studies versus black queer studies versus black feminism. And we have these uh, chunks and pieces of the humanities where people work with um, African-American literary studies but it's often very, very difficult to explain what's going on right now in the context of this deep and rich history and complex history and complex ideas. So again, comment and also an invitation to discussion for my great colleagues. Well, I think, you know, um, just, I mentioned this earlier. I, I was thinking again about it as you were talking about Galena. I think Jeff's um, questioning of purity or pure, the purity of any term, it's very useful for us at this moment, right? Um, and you could give him different students, different examples, right? Like I mentioned, you know, mentioned the blues, right? It's like, what, how do people define a term like any given term, right? Uh, it's loaded or a figure, Du Bois, the Du Bois of the thirties, the Du Bois of the, you know, right before his death, you know, how, even um, like how terms shift historically, um, you know, when I think of uh, Black No More, I think one of the things that interests uh, Jeff uh, in Schuyler's vision in that book is um, that it ends, you know, that the white uh, supremacists actually are and turn out to be Black, to have Black ancestors, right? So this, ver this like virulence against, the non-black, right? They they turn out to be lynched, not because they're blackened up, but because they're found out that they are black. It's just like these different contradictions that the novel comes out. The one drop rule comes back. Right, um, and you know the, the fact that the book ends with people tanning, right? Because people get too too white, and so they have to be brown. And it's you know there's like. I think all throughout uh, Black No More, and, and I think this this delighted Jeff um, to know, and in, in a way that was productive, not just uh, entertainment, mm -hmm. is that there's all the, the money, the economy that keeps that going, right? Um, and I think he he was interested in the again the commercialism of the blues, right? So what are the what are the um, economic um, what's the, what what's the economic fire that keeps 
these terms in 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 uh, circulation. Right, and I think in that that's one of the many ways in which Jeff could help us right now. You know, to to think through. Well, one of the things that I found myself wanting, you know, like, like all of us to have a conversation, you know, there's the essay where he says, um, uh, there's certain ways that racism is no longer practiced and things that you cannot say. And um, it's a different, you know, so that it's um, evolved in a way. And I, you know, then I thought we just went through four years where the things that you couldn't say, you can say again. <laughs> And the things that you couldn't do, you can do. And that none of us, I think, would have predicted that we would, you know, I mean, we knew we'd, we'd be up against something, but not that. And so um, that's the, you know, it's those moments that I would love to have his observations about. And not that, you know, it's, it's evolved, but it's also just as crude as something Skylar might have been up against, right? Um, and I would be fascinated um, to hear him um, kind of observe and engage and interact with the moment that we're in and that, we, um, that we've just come through, if we've come through it. Yeah, I'd love, to ha I'd love to ask Jeff to go back and dig out some literary history to help us understand how the vote suppressors now simply are admitting it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Because it's only a couple of years ago, they they did they just did it. They didn't admit it. You know what does that mean? <laughs> but that literally is the kind of thing Jeff would want to talk about for an hour. You know, and, and you you better be ready to listen. <laughs> so Magdalena, do you think anything Jeff said is ever, ever complete? <laughs> oh, I wish I would have. Um... I, I have to bow to my colleagues who have known him better. I've engaged his work only recently, but I think that the, the model he's developed as much as it is a model, however unfinished, actually invites this playfulness and this going back and forth and constant questioning. So when he talks about Michael Jordan and the idea of flight and this you know, beautiful section uh, where he talks about language and black vernacular and the uses of down and fly, um, I love how he weaves together popular culture, the kind of capitalization on race as a product and performance, and then these big ideas. And I think this is perhaps how we can mobilize students today to resist the kind of soft thinking that David was talking about and, and that, you know, to, to kind of mobilize these paradoxes that Glenda mentioned and Farah mentioned. Um, I, my sense of him as a person, and, and full disclosure, I'm writing a review of this book, so this is super exciting to me, this discussion and the parsing of the work and learning the you know, biographical detail and your knowledge of him as, as a friend and colleague and professional, uh, you know, sometimes a conversationalist, but also counterpart in a, in a sense where you argue and disagree. Um, you know, I think giving students this kind of thinking that they might dismiss as elitist or as exclusive of women, of you know, all the kind of DI issues that we always have to have on the agenda when we discuss race these days and that institutions push often without understanding and without deeply really committing themselves to it. I, um, I think that there is great potential in harnessing this kind of, let's be in the process, let's find the ironies, let's find the humor, but also the depth and profundity because tragedy, like the two masks of the drama, right, are together. They are overlapping tragedy and comedy masks. And I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm thinking of Baldwin. He ends his essay, uh, you know, from 1955, Me and My House, then later, that later beca became Notes of a Native Son with this paradox that you have to do two things that seem impossible and incompatible, but that's the only way to survive and be human and somehow sustain your humanity. And saying yes to life is a part of it. Also in Baldwin, I have to say that I felt a little um, cheated, quote unquote, that Jeff did not include much about Baldwin in this book. Uh, but I think there is a, an interest, especially in the youngest, generation in Generation Z, in our undergraduates. I'm, I'm building a digital collection on, on Baldwin's house and um, I have lined up a class to teach on that. And 
I think there is excitement to like find out what was in his library, what records he was listening to. So that quotidian, everyday life, this sort of um, furnishing of an author's interior, but also exterior of the landscape around his body and how, uh, you know, literature gets made and gets created and how then we meet people through it. And here I'm thinking of you know, Orhan Pamuk, thinking of novels as a place we meet the other, Olga Tokarczuk, the recent Nobel Prize winner, uh, as the world being made of words and calling us to go back and find a tender narrator. This is the kind of story, the kind of exciting humanities work that we can be doing. And, and because I love African-American literature, but I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up uh, here. I, I am from communist Catholic Poland. I did not study with Nathan Hagen. I, um, you know, I, I came into this quite an outsider, but what fascinates me is how very um, American in many ways this dialectic is the descent, the resistance, but then folding into the descent um, and re, you know, refying it, but then counter, countering it with a new thought. Again, resisting that soft thinking and always doing very sort of morally rigorous work uh, against the kind of simplistic binaries and pieties and parochialism. May I try out a, a Ferguson quote here? It's very brief as a way of just reflecting on Uday's question, and then Uday, you can respond if you want. This comes right from Jeff's, uh, I think it's introduction uh, in the Schuyler book, where he says as early as his undergraduate years, he was quote, addicted to independence. And then he goes on to say that uh, he was coming of age at a time when African-American history and literature had become quote, a stronghold of sincerity, melodrama, sentimentalism, and deep seriousness. <laughs> well, we might ask again whether those are all quite back in vogue, but you know, in a different time, in different ways. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I just wish there was more of Jeff to read, and we could get students to read him more. <laughs> yeah, just quickly on that. Uh, point, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for me not to see, you know, uh, an ongoing conversation with Jeff taking place through his engagement with uh, Schuyler, which would, among other things, and this is a meandering way perhaps to get to some aspects of the question that Werner raised, that, um, um, that just like the moment that Schuyler is satirizing, you know, this moment is one in which, you know, uh, notwithstanding the absolute seriousness of the issues that um, you know our societies have had to deal with over the past four four years, that you know that would be the right observation that among those who have benefited most uh, mightily from you know, what's happened has have been academic studying race. That is to say that that would be the you know the deep yeah. sort of biting uh, observation here, which is everybody needs it now, right? <laughs> yes, and it turns out well, you know maybe the world needs us in this sort of wry, ironic and problematic uh, uh, way. And it would be interesting to, to, to you know, to have uh, uh, Jeff write in some sense, the moment that we're in, in response to, uh, we're in conversation with, uh, you know, I think, you know, Skyler's, uh, you know, very incisive observation that those who um, 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 benefit from race are, you know, us <laughs> in some um, uncomfortable kind of way. I was just going to observe quickly, um, we are actually already beyond the proposed time limit, but I see no reason not to regard time limits as one more category that we might question. Um, so anybody who would like to continue, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly enjoying the conversation and um, I don't want to cut it short. Did I see a hand from Ryan? Yeah. Hi, yes, my name's Ryan. I was, uh, Jeff was my advisor at Amherst and then um, mentor after that. Um, and I just want to throw out another category. And I took a class on Baldwin with him where we read almost all of Baldwin. Um, and um, it's interesting to me how the questions that we might ask of this book change if we approach Jeff as a scholar or if we just approach him as an artist and as a writer. I mean, so many of the questions that are coming up about where this is headed are questions that Jeff and I would talk about when we talked about Emerson or when we talked about Baldwin. So although the project is unfinished in some sense, 
I think I think about it like this too. He was he was when I was in New York. I, don't know, I guess it would have been like yeah, 2012 ish. He was talking to me about this book a little bit, and this comment he would make would be, "It's about getting the weave right." He's like, with this kind of book, I have to get the weave right. Um, it, it was as though the, the content of the specific ideas was dwelled in some um, uh, in some deeper inner act of creation. And so, if if I get to write on Jeff, um, and I don't, I, I mean, what I do for my, I, I'm not writing on anything related to what Jeff and I studied but I still read two pages of that Schuyler biography and then start writing my dissertation because <laughs> there's something that's transmitted just in, in, in the artistry. And I remember him, I'll say one other thing cause I want to hear what other people say. I remember being in his office once and he would talk a lot about how he was thinking about teaching. And I know some of his other students are in here as well. And one time he said, you know, Ryan, nobody is asking students to write beautifully. And there's a way that some things about the the path to inner freedom and the life of the mind are hard to put into words and are, are transmitted in these indirect indirect ways that the category of artist allows us to engage um which is why i'm attracted to reading i mean jeff was my friend but if i'm going to talk about his work i would read him in the canon of 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 artists um I, I I have to agree with what Ryan just said. Uh, even though I, I knew Jeff as a scholar, um, the image I have of him is of an artist, uh, uh, artists who used words um, to uh, say interesting things. But you know, I I, I think I, I mean I I know uh, what he said was deep and. Uh, 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 often profound, uh, uh, but there was a certain kind of irreverence to him, which I associate with art. Uh, mm. uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I'll give an example of his humor. Of I, I, I think what I think is uh, uh, his humor uh, and his irreverence. Uh, um, uh, my friendship, I met Jeff uh, at Amherst and uh, um, uh, uh, we went for lunch and uh, he asked me, who am I? And um, I gave him, uh, or he asked me, where do you come from? And uh, uh, like every Indian, I, I thought that was a question about my family. Um, uh, and we were going up these stairs at the back of Williston Hall and he looked at me, he said, there hasn't been a planned pregnancy in my family for 150 years. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, you know it, it left me, I mean, it, it did leave me somewhat embarrassed because I just told him this story about uh, uh, my, the privileges in my family. And yet uh, that became for me uh, an enduring aspect of my friendship with, uh, uh, with Jeff. Um, uh, this irreverence, this combination of insight and irreverence. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Uday, it's so good to see you. I'm sorry. For it's good to see you too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And to hear you, and and yeah, I, I can I just reinforce that Jeff always would rather read and write than do research. Now he did research; he did yeah, serious yeah. research. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, uh, he would he would rather he'd rather actually add think in there. He'd, he'd rather read, think, write, and yeah, research. Yeah. But th that does Ryan. You have a point. He he was, and he was a slow writer. He was a craftsman in yeah. the way he wrote. Yeah. And by the way, in this book, do we have are we treated to some amazing virtuosity of those complex sentences? That section where he's where he's dealing with the word down, that is a paragraph of virtuosity. 
Jeff could talk that way, but there it is on paper. And I, I just, God, his voice was in that page. Well, it's all over the book, but mm -hmm. that's the artist, Ryan. You're right. Um, and I think Jeff would be proud to have heard you say that. <laughs> Maybe that's another way to get back at Uday's question. Did he complete uh, anything? Uh, and also to Magdalena's uh, uh, worry about how do we present this to students? I mean, what, uh, you know, how do we provoke students with a, with a text? And I think in one uh, way, Jeff's individual sentences, and that's what he does have in common with Emerson or with Thoreau, are wonderful aphorisms. I mean, if you wanted yeah. a commonplace book of Jeffisms, <laughs> you know, there's a rich arsenal there just to give people something uh, to think about. On the other hand, George Hutchinson, who is also here in the afterward, argued uh, that there is actually a concluded uh, project. I think you can read it that way too. It is still somewhat fragmentary, but there is a kind of motion in the whole arrangement that he had in mind, that they had planned. And it was going somewhere. So I think the, the uh, pedagogic side of it, I would think, would be to start with the aphorisms, many of which are a provocation right in the way they're formulated now. Not to mention the raucous humor of uh, him at a time, too, that you need a trigger warning before you tell a joke with the punchline. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, if I can take just a moment, I know that. A, Come on. Sorry. Um, I, I know that Glenda and perhaps some others need to leave at 4:30, um, and I, 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 we're happy to continue. I was able to, the the sort of Zoom session stuff. I was able to get an extension until 4:45. Uh, if anyone would like to stick around for a kind of less and less formal uh, uh, conversation, but I did particularly, Glenda, thank you so much. Such a joy to have all five of you. Um, to have met you in this format. Um, so those of you who do need to leave, by all means do, but I, I figure we may as well leave the space open and, and enjoy what conversation um, so remains possible. I'm going to stick around, I'm sure. sure. Augustine, can you stick around a minute? <laughs> I just want to say um, thank you um, and my love to so many people here that um, knew Jeff um, and uh, the kind of family that we formed. Um, uh, under Professor Werner Solers's care. Um, I'm very happy to be part of that family and I'm sorry not to have the time to stick around because I'm really loving this, but thank you and lots of love. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Very -bye. goodbye wonder, as well. I see that you have to go, um, but I what, do, what an but absolute I, I pleasure. Echo, I echo Glinda and um, you know, we, we thank Werner always. Yes. <laughs> I have, to, I have to step away as well. I, think, I wanted to thank Joe for putting this together and to thank Werner um, and, and George for really uh, shepherding that volume. It's really uh, a great tribute to, to, to Jeff and I'm so glad that we have it. So thank nice. you, it was great seeing you again, Ken. Thank you, Ken, pleasure to meet you. You know, I hate to be so profane and you can throw me off of this if you want. But uh, some, some folks out there may or may not have known Jeff that well. You know where he'd be this weekend? He'd be watching the Masters. I'm <laughs> I swear to you. Right, yeah. Uday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't play golf. He was terrible at it. Yeah. But he loved why He thought Tiger Woods was the son of God. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. The, the first thing I thought about um, when Tiger had this accident Oh, me too. I yeah. wanted to learn yeah. what Jeff thought. That's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Thought yeah. Tiger was the son of God. He really did. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's rather profane. Let's get back to the <laughs> here. Yeah. Yeah. Profane, is, profane is what Jeff was. That's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one question we didn't quite get to, David, and I, I would have wanted to ask it of Farah as well. Um, but you said at one point that there were, there were elements of the book you wanted to fight with, you wanted to push back on. Um, oh. Can we, yeah, you know, and can we articulate some of those? Uh, I mean, perhaps you and Magdalena remain from our original panel. There may be some others who. Oh, who I don't have, know. Have I have some underlining well. here. Uh, <laughs> um, my little quarrels with Jeff would have been as as much about language as it was about arguments. I, I would have tangled with him a little about. Come on, make make that a little clearer for me. Come on, 
uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I have to say this time reading through the, I guess I, I hadn't read all of this before. And again, thank you to Werner and to George Hutchinson for doing this. But discussing this I, resistance idea over the years with Jeff, uh, <laughs> it sometimes would get a little loose and out of control. We would just tangent after tangent after tangent because it is such a huge concept. But seeing him put it on the page with such clarity was uh, was really very moving. I, I had the same sense. Uh, um, I, I can't tell you how many coffees I had with uh, Jeff about resistance. Uh, uh, and I was uh, very impressed by this particular chapter. I've, I've read many drafts of it, um, uh, but the sheer clarity of it uh, is striking to me. Uh, I, um, I want to ask you, um, those who knew, knew Jeff personally, why was he so uh, derisive of autobiographical uh, criticism? And if he's taught Baldwin so wildly, obviously uh, he was very familiar with the kind of confessional mode and the autobiographic, autoethnographic mode in his writing. Um, and then, you know, the only encounter with him in video I've, I've had through YouTube. So in one of the speeches, um, he talks about, um, you know, despising the autobiographical and, um, I mentioned a critique of his uh, by Marisa Parham and, and, and this kind of lack of connection to his own story, to kind of more personal, uh, mundane uh, stories that some, some critics of his uh, bring up. Do you have anything to say about that? I, I mean, I, I, I'll say something about it. Um, I, I don't know how many of you knew that uh, Jeff, uh, I mean, uh, as we say, he came from the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, I think his mother had him when she was thirteen years old, uh, uh, and uh, she was a child mother. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, mm, he grew up in Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey, uh, just across the river. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, that uh, uh, the, the, the only reason he ended up at Harvard was that uh, uh, when he was a guardian angel, he went to um, some college event where there was a recruiter um, uh, from Harvard. Um, who was so, imp I mean, and, and Jeff, uh, I vividly remember Jeff saying this to me that the uh, school he went to, one or two percent went to any college. Um, uh, and uh, here was this guy, this recruiter who said, you know, you should apply to Harvard. Um, uh, and um, Jeff said, um, you know, my family can't afford Harvard. We can't even afford the application for Harvard. Um, and then this recruiter, you know, facilitated that and uh, he ended up at Harvard. Um, um, uh, I've seen photographs of him at Harvard wearing that uh, uh, red beret. Um, um, uh, and yet he never wrote about that. That's the irony. Hmm. No, he didn't write this story. He just told it. I mean, to those of us who knew him, uh, we knew this story. Uh, but I don't know of a place where he's written this. Uh, I mean, you know, given the fact that he died uh, you know, so early, um, he may have ended up writing it. So, you know, uh, uh, yeah. This is fascinating. Thank you. I, I, this explains a lot to me because 
there, I think there is a strain of criticism of his work that puts him together with kind of, you know, elitist folks who sort of speak from the ivory tower. And I know with, you know, students I encounter, there is often that, you know, group of Marxists who will say you have to talk about class and you have to sort of embrace working class people and the proletariat, you know, the drill. And I think that discussion in, in the, um, in the book of how important it was for Martin Luther King to uh, attack imperialism, to attack capitalist modes of exploitation and how he did not succeed in it. That's a very important point in the book that I find, um, again, I would love to hear more about it and would love to have heard him write more about class and issues of how class and race and that sort of struggle that King failed at as, as Jeff articulates in the book, um, you know, connecting the struggle against racism to the struggle against imperialism, how that is an important strain that we don't discuss. And here again, another sort of mode of criticism can come in, which would be the, the sort of feminist approach, the personal is the political, and how do you, you know, get away from, as Baldwin would say it, everything is personal. Uh, from this, you know, it has shaped you as much as the guardian angel stint, as much as Harvard. Why is it so hard to talk about it? And that YouTube video I mentioned, uh, that's from, I think, 2011, and I think he was already ill at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, you know, that humble origin, that connection to the folks that Gandhi would have embraced, that's in his biography now I know from you, thank you. And it really explains a lot, I think, about the ways in which the book takes on the issue of class but doesn't really run with it. And again, it's uh, in that sense, there is the skeleton, there is the scaffolding of the project, but I wish he had written that book as well. Magdalena, uh... Others have done this too, and others here know. I'll send you this essay I wrote on Jeff because there's a good deal please, in it. Please, please. His father, his, his his sister, his nephews, and so on. Um, I don't want to get too psychological about this uh, because uh, Jeff may have had some literary reasons he didn't especially appreciate the autobiographical mode, but Jeff. Uh, it took Jeff a very long time. He had to know somebody very well before he would ever tell his story. Mm. Yes, and you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. This is somebody who is not just deep working class. This is really wrong side of the tracks early yeah. on. Um, mm. And there's a very painful family story. And yet, this is someone who adored both of his parents as different as they were yeah. took, took care of his father may have had an eighth grade education yeah yeah, yeah. if that his father was a hustler among <laughs> youth yeah. and yeah. worked in alternative economies uh <laughs> and uh you know jeff as a child <laughs> rode around with his dad on you know on uh, to work as it were and uh jeff brought this with him to harvard and he's hanging out in the dining hall at Adam's house, and uh, you know he didn't have a he didn't have a story like anybody else. Yeah. And it, it took us some time. I mean, we became very good friends, and then he came to Amherst, and and Uday became part of all this. And but it took a long time before he could even talk about that. So I don't know that, but he may have had good intellectual literary reasons to resist the autobiographical mode in other people. I, I don't know. I, that would be an interesting thing to get him to answer. <laughs> um, would have asked, what about this sort of gender dimension of autobiography? You know how we used to talk about women in the 90s, women write autobiographically, men write politically and all that, you know, dichotomous. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to ask Augustina, um, uh, uh, what were the, I mean, what were the, I, I know it from my side, the day he met you or the day he uh, got attracted to you. He, but how did you feel? Uh, uh, 
I know how my wife felt when she first met him. Um, uh, you know, how did you feel? When sure, you... Uday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead. <laughs> Augustina, do you have something to say about your late husband? I do. I'll keep it short. I have a lot to say. First, I want to thank you and Ryan so much because to me, Jeff is brilliant, philosophical, but he's such an artist with words and it's provocative art and it's beautiful. And I'm really thankful that you mentioned that or see his work that way, Ryan, so much. Um, but I the memorial, I heard a lot of stories of Jeff's friends, and I would say that all the things that sometimes rub people the wrong way about Jeff, <laughs> I found fascinating and wonderful. I was like, this is a guy, there's no pretense. This person just says it like it is, and I just, that's such a big part of Jeff's. He just won't. He just says it out there and doesn't care about discomfort or any kind of weird social things that have to be yeah i don't know i appreciated that so much I found them fascinating so you know, i'll tell a story about uh, uh, my wife uh, she for the first several years just utterly disliked jeff <laughs> <laughs> and she had a reason because <laughs> he was my first wife <laughs> uh, he kind of was <laughs> because every evening after dinner I would go to Rio's and uh, have coffee with him and you know she was not accustomed to this behavior you know she uh, <laughs> uh, you know uh, expected a certain kind of uh, normal marriage uh, and uh, you know she said what, what are you doing um, uh, you go off after dinner and you always have coffee with this guy. Uh, you know, uh, so, so I, I mean, the point I'm making is uh, uh, he was not your ordinary feminist. No. Um, no, and he took his time to come to, uh, shall we say, gender analysis. But let yeah. me, ask just, uh, Augustina, I'm not sure I ever told you this story. In Jeff's first years at Amherst, this, this intellectual we're describing very often had no sense of social time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he would call at 11 o'clock at night. He wouldn't yes. know what time it is. Yeah. And he would want to talk for an hour and a half about what he was reading and thinking about. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Jeff, I got to teach tomorrow. Yeah, but let me, but but let me let me ask you about this. And so my wife Karen and I then had a, had a, an arrangement that after a while, at the right signal, she would go hit the doorbell or something that, that would draw me off the phone because I had to go to sleep. But but Jeff was just going to think all night and talk all night, and a lot of you have experienced this, I'm sure. But also that was that was that was uh, Jeff's sense of himself in the world. He became. Um, well, shall we say, better at dinner parties over time. <laughs> but at first, Jeff wouldn't have much to say around. No small talk. <laughs> What's that? No, he just oh. didn't believe in small talk either. No, he couldn't he do small talk. In. That's yeah. why. <laughs> and faculty gossip, forget it. You know, and I love that about him. I mean, me I... too. <laughs> so much. Anyway, sorry. And, I, and this, um... yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, speaking of time and running on in conversations, I don't know if they're going to shut the lights off at 445 or not. I do know that I had to plead for a little bit of extra time from the Zoom powers that be. Um, uh, can I invite anyone who hasn't had an opportunity to say something to speak, uh, if there's any final words that, that we ought to have here? Um, I think there are more former you, students Joe. here. I see Mari Crabtree. I'm sorry, Werner, I couldn't hear you just thanking you for setting up this thing and fighting for 15 extra minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what a pleasure to meet all of you. Those of you who spoke and those of you who didn't, um, those of you who are Jeffrey's friends and those of you who are academics who found your way to this work. Will, did you have something? Is that a hand I'm seeing? I, I just want to acknowledge a number of us are some of his former students and very much attribute um, our success academically to the uh, high standards he set us 
he set for us at Amherst. And I know um, uh, uh, Justin Mitchell and Jesse McCarthy uh, were at Amherst around the same time as, as I was. And we all feel very deeply indebted um, to Professor Ferguson's perfectionism <laughs> um, and his, uh, his, his, his insistence on um, challenging your assumptions. Joe, has this been taped by any chance? We are, we are recording it and we will have it. I, I'm, I, I believe that Mellis people themselves are doing it. They, they suggested just as backup that I would tape it as well. Um, we will make it available in some fashion. I, I apologize for my technological illiteracy, but there'll be something. Someone suggested an ability to, to post it to YouTube somehow, and, and we'll make sure it gets out there for anybody who would like it. But, but let me invite anyone who's here who wants to email me in the next few days if, if you're not able to find access to it. By some point, we'll have it worked out. So. Thank you very much, Joe. And I thank Werner for uh, drawing me into this and inviting me. Um, as always, uh, we met later in life and in my career, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship as, um, you know, me, a would-be student, a junior colleague, and um, so privileged and honored to have been a part of this and met everyone on, over Zoom. Yeah. Thank you. And, thank and you. to our panelists who remain, Magdalene and David, thank you so much for, for the conversation. It's really wonderful. Um, to Ryan, Will, and the rest of you as students, I, I guess one of the first questions we had was, does he see an answer to some of this? Um, and I think the fact that he's inspired uh, students um, of, of, of your apparent caliber is really something. So uh, it's very moving. Augustina, a pleasure to meet you in this context. I, I hope that this has been meaningful uh, to see ways in which um, Jeffrey uh, remains present in, in his writing. Um, thank you all. I, I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Thank you for joining us for this panel and for Mellis in general. Um, really an incredible privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe, everybody. Do this in person soon. Oh, okay. yeah. We Come need in. a party, David. You're right. I mean, we're going to be in New Orleans next year for Mellis. If we can twist some arms, we'd love to have all of you. Okay. All right. I don't go to Mellis, but I'll go to New Orleans. <laughs> we'll take you, David. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Excellent. Bye -bye. Augustina, stay well. Bye, Werner. Great Bye,